Hi guys, it is an absolutely beautiful day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization outside of Austin, Texas. Um, getting up towards the first day of spring, it's already feeling like summer here in Texas. And my name is Sam Mitchell and you have stumbled into Collapse Chronicles where guys, it is that long overdue that I have uh, invited this guest onto my show where tonight we're going to have the good fortune of talking to none other than Lear Keith. Now, my guess is that uh, uh, most of you are probably somewhat familiar with Lear Keith and her work, but if not, from her website, Lear Keith calls herself an American writer, a radical feminist, a food activist, and an environmentalist. I'm somewhat surprised she calls herself an environmentalist. We'll talk about that. Um, she is the author of the highly acclaimed The Vegetarian Myth, Food Justice and Sustainability, which got her in a little bit of hot water with the, uh, with the vegans. We're not going to spend a lot of time talking about the, the vegan wars here. There's plenty of other places on YouTube to find that. Other than that book, she is co-author with Derek Jetson and Eric McBay of Deep Green Resistance, Strategy to Save the Planet, and she is the editor of the Derek Jensen Reader Writings on Environmental Revolution. She has been arrested, well, when this was written, six times. She lives in Northern California. And most importantly, um, for the subject of our conversation, Lier is the co-author with Derek Jensen of the new book, Bright Green Lies, which I hear is presently going to press and will be out soon. And so we're going to get an inside peek at Bright Green Lies and whatever else we can think of to talk about tonight. So it's going to be a lively conversation. So Lee Keith, come on and say hello to the folks at Collapse Chronicles and we're going to dive right into this rousing conversation. Well, thanks for having me on your show. Okay. We'll see if you say that at the end of the show later. <laughs> we're we're going to have some fun. So anyway, before we dive in, d define three terms for us. Green, deep green, and bright green. What is the shades, the, the three shades of green and how is that going to affect the rest of this conversation, just so we have some terms defined? Sure. So I would say that green, at this point, the color green is the color of the environmental movement generally. Like when people say the word you know, green, it's a green solution or it's a green economy, they, they mean something that in some way is trying to prioritize environmental health. Uh, and that probably started with the very first Earth Day, where, you know, it was already the green color. And it's because, you know, when we look around on our planet, we see green. It's actually the planet is more blue than anything else because it's more water. But we don't live in the ocean. We're not ocean creatures. So to us, the world is really very green because of all the plants that cover the land masses. So I, I don't think it's strange that green is the color that we associate with our living world. So I think that's basically green. Um, the way that we use deep green, as in deep green resistance, uh, there's people before us were the deep ecologists. And their main critique of um, you know, the culture that we live in was that it, it's consuming everything, you know, that it sees the natural world as simply um, you know, objects for us to use and things that that we can just take as much as we want because it doesn't matter, that human lives are the only ones that matter and that all these other creatures don't have a claim to their lives and that n we don't need them for anything and we're not connected to them in any way. And none of that is true. I mean, you and I cannot make oxygen. We can't photosynthesize. We can't directly capture the sun's rays and turn that into mass and food for other creatures. So 
we are utterly dependent on you know every other living creature on this planet it's a web you know it's not a hierarchy and it's not even really a circle it's we are all interdependent and I, that's really the insight i think of the deep green ecologist that and that, that there's a spiritual element to that as well um that you know we need to be in awe of these processes that keep us all alive and this may be the only planet that supports life so it's kind of an incredible thing to be here um so that was where we you know that uh, it's sort of paying paying our own dues to say that you know we we uh, certainly a thread of what we are suggesting it comes from those critiques and those philosophers um so when we talk about deep green resistance we mean a resistance that's profoundly biophilic that's profoundly centered on the the life of the earth and it's not necessarily about putting human needs first it really is about seeing that humans are just one tiny species amongst so many millions billions of creatures that are here on the planet um so we 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 try to be biophilic rather than you know androphilic or human centered in any way so it implies i mean there there there's some implication that someone who is not we're, we're going to get the bright green in a minute mm-hmm. but uh but someone who identifies as green by and large i'm reading that more as the mainstream environmental movement and the deep green has a little more of a radical edge to it is that yeah i would absolutely say that that is accurate it's a more radical analysis it's a deeper analysis and of course the when you put the biocentrism sort of in the middle of your analysis when you really care about all the other creatures on the planet you end up identifying a whole different set of problems than you would otherwise and those really require a completely different set of solutions So I would say yes it is definitely more radical. Okay, so bright green which you chose to uh name your book Bright Green Lies. I I I just can't help but feel Lear that that you're already setting yourself up for a repeat of the vegan wars with the uh <laughs> I I have a term for the greenies but I'm not going to use it on this channel uh that that I sometimes use for the mainstream uh, environmentalists so to find bright green but for them we'll get into the bright green lives after we understand what bright green is I would say that the what I would call bright greens are people who think that if we simply switch from fossil fuel to some other source of power that industrial civilization can continue. So the main problem is simply that we're using fossil fuel and that that is solvable using technological silver bullets and that there's nothing else wrong with this way of life. So all we need to do is switch power and everything will be fine and that's why we call it right is because there I would it, the best way to put it is that they're extremely optimistic. That's the most charitable thing I can say is that they're extremely <laughs> optimistic. You 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 can use uh a, a apocalyptic on this channel. Uh I'm sure you've heard the term of apocalyptic and and <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and hopium is uh, yeah, hopium, ho- hopium yep. smokers and apocalyptic yeah. So don't don't be no don't be afraid. I mean if you if you want to throw out terms like this, I mean other other guests have. So obviously you and the other authors of this book take issue with this. So let's just dive right into it and and start breaking it down. I know a lot of us have been waiting for a long time for this book. So give us your main thesis. and just go on a tear layer Keith and uh tell us the lie well plural tell us the lies in the bright green lies and why renewable energy is not going to save this planet even if we do manage to get off of fossil fuels which is a big if take right. it away so okay <laughs> this is multi-layered the the central problem the real problem is that It used to be that the environmental movement was about saving wild places and wild creatures. 
So the places that we loved and the creatures that we loved, and those creatures have a right to their lives. They have a right to continue existing as species. Um, and those wild places are their homes. And we used to care about them. We used to go to bat for wolves and for Scottish wildcats and for whales and for starfish and for name the creature. There were humans that loved that creature and were willing to do everything they could to save them. And, you know, this starts with Rachel Carson trying to save the songbirds. You know, in Silent Spring, she was willing to pay a huge personal price to go up against the chemical industry, which nobody really had done to that point. And that was really the beginning of the modern environmental movement because she saw that these poisons were wipe, literally just wiping out life. And, of course, the songbirds were the canaries in the coal mine, but somebody had to stand up and say that <laughs> better living through chemistry was not better living. It was, in fact, a death sentence. And who were we going to be as people and as a planet if all the birds were gone? And one by one, we killed all our kin. Like, it was madness to cover the world in poison. And she was right. So that was really the beginning of it. But it was a very biophilic, a very biocentric worldview to say that the birds matter. That, 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 it, that you know, the planet is diminished as we lose our kin. And that it's worth fighting for them. And it's, I mean, you can make the argument from justice and you can make the argument from self-preservation. And the argument from justice is they have a right to live. We do not have, I mean, there's just no reason for this kind of hubris that you can't, you can't just wipe species out and pretend that it doesn't matter. Like they, I don't understand how people don't feel the horror in that, that we can just so blithely, every single day, 200 species are going extinct. Those are creatures that will never exist again. And it's simply through our greed and stupidity and hubris that we're doing this. And then the other argument is the argument, you know, from self-preservation, which is even if you don't care about them for their own selves, we can't rend the fabric of life to this extent and still exist ourselves. We're going to run out of oxygen if we're not careful. I mean, two thirds of the oxygen in this, on this planet is made by phytoplankton in the ocean. So they're, you know, little tiny organisms that can do phytos photosynthesis. I mean, we don't, we can't really see them as individuals without a microscope particularly, but they're tiny. But, you know, they're small but mighty. They make all of our, our two-thirds of our oxygen. And what are we going to breathe when they're gone? Well, they are dying. You know, the, the oceans are collapsing due to a bunch of things, but especially through global warming. The oceans have done their best to absorb all of that excess carbon, but it means they're too acid now. So that's one of the reasons that there are phytoplankton die-offs uh, sort of en masse across the oceans. And I don't know how people aren't absolutely in terror about this. You know, there might not be enough oxygen in 50 years or 100 years simply from that. So that's what, that's what we're doing. And that used to be the things that the environmental movement cared about, that we were killed on the planet, that we were doing tremendous damage to all these other creatures, and that we felt their existence as our kin you know they were our brothers and our sisters and our mothers and our grandparents and that that is that's the i mean it's i think that that is a perspective that has been in human culture around the world really everywhere until very recently you can go into any indigenous culture and you will hear that the trees are our grandparents and it's not really a metaphor you know it's like the plants made the act Without the atmosphere, we wouldn't be here. Like they're the ones who made that balance of the carbon cycle happen. So there was oxygen and carbon dioxide, and then animals came to be, and it was because of what the plants did first. So, in just in terms of, you know, time, like who came first? The plants did that for us, and you know, people didn't have archaeology then, and they didn't have microscopes, but they knew that they somehow knew that the plants came first. And that they made our lives possible and that we deserve, you know, they deserve respect and awe and, you know, some kind of thank you from us instead of what we've been doing, which is mass destruction. So anyway, that was what the environmental movement used to be, was that we cared about those things. And then something changed. So in my lifetime, I've watched this happen, particularly over the last 20 years. And I don't really have an explanation for it. Yeah. It used to be that we cared about those places and those creatures. And now it is completely about 
how do we continue to destroy those creatures and those places? Because the only thing anybody cares about is how to continue industrial civilization. So instead of noticing that industrial civilization is the problem, instead, the problem has become, how do we continue to power industrial civilization? So it's quite clear that burning fossil fuel has had a very bad impact on the planet. And so instead of saying, hmm, <laughs> what are we using all this power for? Maybe it's not such a great idea because in fact, what we've been doing is taking living creatures, living communities, turning them into dead commodities, and then piling up private wealth from that, like every step of the way, this is just a nightmare. Instead, what they're saying is, no, no, let's continue to do all of that. We just need to find another power source. So at this point, most of the mainstream environmental groups, um, you know, their main gig is we need solar, we need wind, we need hydro, we need biomass. We need these things that are called carbon neutral, um, and if we could just substitute in this kind of power rather than that kind of power, we can keep industrial civilization going. And that's what they care about is keeping this way of life intact. And I'm just utterly horrified by this, but also completely bewildered <laughs> that this has happened to my yeah. movement. I don't understand. I, I don't understand where everybody went. Like, how did that suddenly become the thing we're going to fight for? Destroying the planet now is the goal. We're just going to find another power source. Now, now, Lier, uh, of course you know that the, the whatever you want to call them, the, the, the bright greenies are, would, would take issue with that, would, would take issue with that statement. Uh, you, you, you know that, that they would say they, I, I, I honestly don't know, Lair, if, if they honestly believe that getting off fossil fuels will let us just do what we do and because we're not putting as much carbon in the air, which we, which I'm not at all convinced that we're not going to be putting as much carbon yeah. in the air, it, 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 it's, it's going to be the fix-all, it's, it's going to be the panacea when they're not talking about the, you know, the other eight planetary boundaries. But before we get into the renewables, what is your take on, are, are we even going to be able to get off of fossil fuels? Well, I mean, this is one of the lies that we talk about in the book is we can, you know, it's, <laughs> we've got fossil fuel and then we have alternative fossil fuel because they want to call it alternative energy, but it's not. All of it rests on the exact same industrial platform. None of these technologies would exist without fossil fuel. And that's one of the things that these people just simply refuse to face. Like oil and gas, actual fossil fuels are, they're functionally irreplaceable in an industrial economy. And oil has an energy density, which means that you can fill up something like, you know, a giant <laughs> ship, you know, so you can get stuff from China. Like that, you can't, you're not going to do that with any other fuel source, like it doesn't have the energy density. Or for instance, the interstate trucking system that, you know, brings all this stuff across continents for us. And it, you know, like your average truck has a 60,000 pound payload, but in order to use something like solar power to do that or wind power, you would have to have 55,000 pounds of batteries. Now that only leaves 5,000 pounds for the cargo. It clearly isn't going to work, but this is basic math. Like this isn't wasn't complicated to figure this stuff out, and and other people have already done it too. I mean, entire books have been written about this, and all the information is there. And yet they continue to sort of put forward this. It's a mythology, really, that somehow you know we're going to just switch out oil and gas for solar, wind, hydro. You know, pick the one of the day, and it'll work. And it simply won't. There's nothing that replaces the energy density of oil and gas. So, I, I mean, it's just, it's not physically possible to do that. It, yeah, I, I mean, I, I just don't think it's going to, I mean, I, I paid $1.79 a gallon for a gallon of gas in Austin, Texas today is a dollar, well, yesterday was a dollar seventy nine. It's probably a dollar sixty nine. Some somewhere in Austin today, you can buy a gallon of gas for a dollar sixty nine. There is zero sign that, that I that I am seeing. 
uh, behind all the talk, uh, you know, where where's the where's the beef? Uh, yeah. So, is it, is part of the book? Since obviously I don't have the manuscript in front of me, you know, to to go through and get your response off. It, so, so part of the book talks of, of, about the, as you called it, the mythology of even getting off fossil fuels. That that's the first part of the hopium. And the yeah, first it's, it's not. It simply isn't possible. Like, there's nothing. There's nothing else that can substitute for the amount of energy it takes to run an industrial economy. There's nothing else that's going to provide that. And you know, we go through some of the plans that people have come up with, like Mark Jacobson. There's this, you know, engineer who's come up with these plans, how we could switch to 100% renewables. And anybody, and other engineers have done this as well. I mean, you just go through the plan step by step, and it simply isn't possible. Like, you know, it, huge amounts of it, he wants to come from hydro, because there's not really anywhere else it can come from. But there literally aren't enough rivers in the United States for it to be done. Most of the major rivers already have multiple dams on them. And let's ju- And the other thing to throw in here is that dams, in fact... Um, are huge releasers of both carbon and methane. In fact, they've been called methane bombs because they release so much methane. So they are politically have been called carbon neutral so that countries can use dams in their great accounting of how well they're doing toward this. But on the ground in reality, and of course in the atmosphere in reality, uh, it's only making the situation worse. So places like Costa Rica or whatever who, you know, they're all dependent on these hydroelectric dams, it, they're not carbon neutral in any way. They're only declared that because, you know, for whatever reason, it's been decided that's politically expedient. But it's not true. Yeah, um, Costa, they Costa Rica. These huge amounts of methane and carbon it, yeah. are released to build those dams. The Costa Rica is the poster child. If you have to find the poster child of the bright green lies, don't get me going. I actually wrote a book, Lear. You were talking to the author yeah. of a book on the waterfalls of Costa Rica that I wrote in 1992. And it was unbelievable when I was walking around. I did 32 waterfalls in Costa Rica. And how many of them back in 1992 in these beautiful rainforests? I mean, I was the only gringo, one of the few gringos to ever lay eyes on these places. And, and I was basically writing a, a guidebook to dinosaurs. Waterfall after waterfall after waterfall. The people were saying, you know, this waterfall is going to be gone in a few years. Uh, that this is going to be a hydroelectric dam. I would like to go back with those 32 waterfalls and see how many of them are even, and it's not just the waterfall, it's the whole rainforest surrounding it, the whole river valley, the riparian corridors, how they can sit there and, and, and call hydropower clean, green, renewable energy. It just floors me. It, it, it's horrifying. and. I mean, just setting aside the methane and the carbon, which, yeah. you know, is they releases just vast quantities of this stuff. They are not carbon neutral. They're just absolute nightmares. Um, what dams do to rivers? They kill them. Just flat out kill them. Yeah. Like, it's no longer a river. What's downstream from the dam is too shallow and it's muddy and the fish can't survive in it. And then you have all this erosion. All the trees die along the way because they need the nutrients from the fish and like just step by step, it's everything is just slowly eroded and killed. Um, and then when you have these releases from the dams, the fish that are trying to live there certainly can't survive it because it's this huge flood of water, and then the water is completely still. And so there's either creatures that evolved in sort of the still edges of little ponds and pools along rivers who can't take the pressure of that huge pulse of water, or you have fish that need constantly moving water, and when the water is still, it's too warm and there aren't enough nutrients. So just, I mean, just, you know, step by step by step, the entire river is killed when you put in a hydroelectric dam. So the only good thing you can say about dams is that eventually they fail. That's like the only good thing you can say about them. <laughs> so the and, and it's beyond me that anybody who calls themselves an environmentalist could think this is a good thing. I don't, I don't know how you think it's okay to kill a river. Yeah, the, the methane bomb... It is from the from from all of the plant material that that basically just rots. 
yeah. and, and bubbles up, and, and, and yeah. that, that's that's where the methane bomb comes from. It's just yeah, it's, ana it's anaerobic decomposition underneath the water, and that's just this huge amount of methane. So they they are not carbon neutral. They are really horrifying for the atmosphere. Is the United Nations still pushing hydropower and their yes, sustainable absolutely. development goals? Absolutely, everybody is. Everybody, all of these bright greens across the world. Everybody thinks they're wonderful. And I, the other thing to remember about dams is that they are universally protested by the people who live there. Like yeah. People don't want their rivers and their forests destroyed for this. And the people who live there never get to, quote, benefit from this electricity. Not that they want it, but even when they're offered it, they don't. But they don't even get it. It's always used for industrial processes like mining, <laughs> like, you know, smelting aluminum for or copper for industrial use. Um, these kinds of high energy uh, industrial processes like, you know, iron and whatnot are, are always situated near dams because then they get the cheap electricity, they get industrial rates and they'll make, you know, various deals with the government, but then they can get it really cheap. And that's where we get steel and copper and whatnot is it's always from that. So that, you know, is just another piece of the puzzle. Like it's again, it's for industrial uses it's not i mean everyone always wants oh we're gonna save people in hospitals like that's not why they're doing this it's for industrial um, production it's for the manufacture of the, you know sort of the industrial infrastructure so that's yeah. especially true in the amazon rainforest where good lord i think there's 43 of these major dam projects 43 of these major dams and there's like 10 million people it, it, it's for it, it's for iron ore smelting yeah of course it, it, yeah it's, that's uh, it's always the case so and then all and all the indigenous people are completely displaced by it because yeah. you know it's their land and it's is true around the world it doesn't matter whether it's india or whether it's south america um you know the indigenous people put up whatever fight they can and it's never enough the army comes in and or the private army one way or the other and the people are removed and they're killed and um, you know, they end up, whatever's left of them ends up in utter poverty, in urban squalor, whatever. So it's, it's, they're genocidal projects as well. You can't take people off their land and have the people remain. It's, you know, they're in shreds when it's over. So just on every level, this is a nightmare. And I'll just say one more time, I'm utterly bewildered why anybody who calls themselves an environmentalist can get behind these projects. Well, they're just buying into this whole BS UN sustainable development goals. The, the very, I, it was in one of Derek's books, it wasn't him, it was the, the book of interviews he had back in the 90s. I can't remember who it was that he was interviewing back in the 90s who said, watch that this sustainable development is going to become the oxymoron of the 21st century. And whoever made that call <laughs> back in the 90s, whoever it was that, Derek, I need to reread that book for some more interview ideas myself, but they called it. that It, it, it is sustainable yeah. development. Just give, give, give me your spin. What, what, what is your opinion of the term sustainable development? And is it a goal? Well, it, I mean, it can't be, because when they say development, what they mean is, they mean two things. They mean capitalism, and they mean industrialism. And neither of those things is ever going to be sustainable. To sustainable. Capitalism is based on a model of infinite growth. Uh, capitalism has to grow by about 2.5 to 3% every year, or else the entire system collapses. You can't have that on a finite planet. I mean, any small child could tell you, <laughs> if you take all the stuff, there's nothing left. And we only have so much stuff. And as it stands right now, 40% of the primary production and then another 40% of the secondary production of basic stuff on Earth goes to humans. So we're taking it all. We're taking all the sunlight, all the plants, all the animals. It's all just being funneled into humans. Um, and that obviously can't go on. So, yeah, so the this, this capitalism part is absolutely not sustainable. But if you want to look at industrialization as sort of another system that overlaps with capitalism, that is also not sustainable because industrialization has also survived in other economic models. There's, it's been under you know, various communist regimes, the Soviet Union, China, whatever. It, so that will survive all kinds of different political systems around it and economic systems. But it's, it's still its own thing, and it will demand, and it seems to get what, it's, what it wants. You know, it's, like, it's the machine that seems to make all its own parts 
you know, like be slaves to it essentially. So it's just machines building machines at this point and humans sort of barely exist in its consciousness. Right. And yet we are the people who are supposedly in control of it. And yet here we are where, you know, all of our, our entire planet is just being fed into it. And what are we going to have at the end? I mean, it, we, it's so bizarre to me that in the popular mind, everyone seems to know that this is looming. When you think about all those dystopian movies and the Blade Runner and the Mad Max, and that, like that's exactly what we're looking at is that sort of desertified landscape with, you know, petty warlords and it, like crumbling machines that people are still trying to keep going and there's no water and everybody's half star. I mean, like we all know where it ends. Um, but nobody seems willing to stand up and say, this is not inevitable. Like we could make it stop. But the, 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 the renewal, the, the bright green lights. Anyway, okay. We, we've, we, we, we've gone through hydropower. Okay. So let's get to the, the two big ones. Let's, let's, uh, jump on solar first. So okay. when you hear that solar power is going to save the planet, I, uh, do you even bother talking to people anymore in private conversation or do you <laughs> take it to YouTube, as I said? My friends tell me to take it to YouTube when they get sick of hearing me talk about it. Solar is going to save the planet, Blair, Keith. What do you say back to that statement? Then we'll well, I mean, it, it obviously can't. And the amount of... Okay, there's two, two things to say about solar. The first is... Like all of these technologies, it rests on a completely industrial platform. Um, and so you can't, you're not actually going to make this stuff without industrial, without industrial quantities of energy, which is to say oil and gas. You have to understand what goes into making a solar panel. And again, this is one of these things that the, you know, the sort of origin myth of all of these, like they don't grow on trees. They are industrially manufactured products. So the amount of stuff that goes into making a solar panel is really rather frightening because first of all, you need all the rare earths. Um, the reason that rare earth minerals are called rare earths is that they don't exist in large veins. So other metals do like, you know, copper say you can find a copper mine or a silver mine or a gold mine. And there's a lot of it. Okay. You find veins of it in the earth, but the rare earth minerals don't exist like that. They exist. Um, they're very dispersed. And they only exist in a few places. So there's, you know, like the Congo is where some of them comes from. And there's parts of China, actually Tibet as well, where some of this stuff comes from. But it's an incredibly destructive process because all open pit mining is absolutely horrifying. Let's just get that out of the way. If you've never been to one of these sites, I don't even recommend that you go because it's so horrible and very toxic. But you can go to YouTube and look at pictures or to, you know, Google and look at pictures. We're talking about, you know, pit mining at a scale that will not heal except in geologic time. Okay. Just absolutely gigantic machines are used to scrape out the earth and extract the stuff that somebody wants. Um, and incredibly toxic along the way. You can even go back to ancient Greece, ancient Rome, um, the different mines that the Romans use, say so silver mines, they had copper mines, um, lead mines, they utterly toxified Europe with these mines. And that's a long time ago now, and you can still see it. <laughs> There's still places that are incredibly toxic because of those mines. They say that something like 800 tons of um, lead was dumped as far away as Greenland from the Roman lead mines. So that's how much of this particulate was sent up into the atmosphere. And it was literally brought down snowflake by snowflake yeah into Greenland and over a few hundred years, it managed to be 800 tons. So try to imagine the scale of this, like how much stuff they were releasing into the air for 800 tons of it to accumulate it, snowflake by snowflake as far away as Greenland, which is like 2000 miles away. So they utterly toxified Europe and they were probably, it could have been millions of people who were dead, died from this. Like that's how toxic they made it all. And nothing has changed. Like that's still what the process is. So well, it has the thing that's changed is there. There's a whole lot more people. It's it, it, it's it's bizarre when you really start studying. I, I don't I don't have the numbers in front of me. Is really how small 
the, the entire Roman Empire, I mean, just in terms of number of people, it, it, it's like, uh, you, you know, it wouldn't even rate as just a, just a mid-sized American city, uh, right. much less a Chinese city. The entire Roman Empire, the, the damage that, as you, you just mentioned, this one example, just and, and you take that, and how many times has this uh, global economy uh, turned over and over and over and over uh, since the Roman Empire? And you start adding up the carnage. But it's, so it's horrifying. And so to make these, whether it's um, solar or um, wind power, they need a lot of these rare earth minerals, as well as these really high tech gadgets like our computers and our cell phones and all this. It's all dependent on these rare earth minerals, um, and they're, they are the most toxic mines because it's so dispersed in the soil. So they have to dig up just endless pits, you know, and then kind of sift through it. Um, and they use really really toxic chemicals to extract the minerals that they want and. So there's like this giant toxic lake in China now yeah. um, around this one, around one town, and nobody can live there anymore. Yeah. It's so toxic that birds die you know, when they fly over it. Everybody has either cancer or um, you know, their liver failure, asthma. It, no vegetables will grow there anymore. All of the livestock have died. And this is what we're inflicting on people around the world and calling it green. And well, and don't forget, Lair, I mean, do you, do you even go into this in the book? Uh, the, the utopian, the techno-utopian apocalyptic answer to that is we're just going to start mining the bottom of the ocean, the deep sea mining. These rare earths, they're lying around in these things that look kind of like potatoes. And they're just lying all around. We just have to go down there and pick them up. Do you get into deep sea mining in, in the book, or did you not have time to even go there? We didn't talk about it too much, and it's one of those things that should just be utterly obvious to everyone, that you will destroy the oceans if you do this. And then what, where will we be? I mean, there, just, there will be no life if we destroy the oceans. I'll just go back to my statement about the phytoplankton. Like, two-thirds of every... Like all the oxygen that animal animals need, two out of every three breaths is made possible by that phytoplankton. What do we think we're going to breathe in 50 years if we go ahead with these projects? It's complete insanity. Yeah. Like the disconnect here just makes no sense. Well, it's at all. Out, of out of mind is what it is. Uh, put it at or the bottom of the ocean. I, keep the keep the deep green, <sighs> you know. Uh, radicals that they're not going to follow us down to the bottom of the ocean it's just it's just the latest like where does this madness end if, if they start if they, if they go through with this between the deep sea mining and the chinese belt and road initiative we're done for we're yeah. done for so that's one problem with the solar and the wind is is you know just getting the stuff to make it then in order to try to produce enough electricity that we could even try to replace oil and gas, which I will repeat are not actually functionally replaceable. But let's pretend they could make batteries small enough that you could still power things like trucks and cars with these batteries. It's not really possible. Let's just let's grant them that, though. Let's pretend. Um, I mean, you'd have to cover something like you know 90% of the continent with like insane amounts of either wind farms or solar farms to make this possible, which nobody, and you can't do it. So that's why they all default to hydroelectric dams. But again, there aren't enough rivers to make it happen. So, I mean, it just isn't, like, there's no way. Like, oil and gas have been condensing under the surface of the, the planet for millions of years. That's why it's so dense. It's had millions of years. And every day we get a little bit of sunlight on this planet, but it hasn't been condensed to that degree. Yeah. You're not going to get, like, it's 46 joules per whatever for oil and gas, and you're never going to get that out of just a little bit of sunlight every day. And I just don't see why that isn't common sense to most people. But anyway, so there's not, even to make all the cement and the copper and the regular things that we know about, the steel that would go into making, you know, the, the plans that people like Mark Jacobson have, like, it doesn't exist. It would be the entire steel production of the entire world for the entire year to make the amount of solar and wind turbines and whatever that, you know, just to make the actual equipment, which we don't have. I mean, just it, that amount of steel doesn't exist. 
and the amount of concrete needed to put these things in place. You have to understand, every ton of concrete that you make literally re releases a ton of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. It's like, why? why? Like, why would you make that much concrete? You're, it's just going to kill the planet more. So again, it's still, it's the same industrial platform um, that's killing the planet. So like adding more industrial stuff to it, even just common sense wise, wouldn't work. But when you run the numbers, of course it doesn't work. So, and then everybody wants to say, oh, Germany's doing it. And it's just, I don't know whether they're super naive and they really want to believe it or whether they are actually lying to themselves. But you know, like Germany is really only making about 3.3% of their energy consumption comes from solar. And honestly, they can't make any more. They put in billions of dollars to build all this infrastructure. And that's really as good as it's ever going to get. Like, there isn't that much sunshine. <laughs> it's a fairly northern latitude. Yeah. Um, the sun doesn't shine half of the day. And that's really as good as it gets. So it's a tiny little sip of energy is all you're ever going to get. Um, and you're never going to replace oil and gas, which is, again, most of the energy is used for um, heat for cars, for trucks, you know, for trains, for stuff like for transportation, stuff like that. Uh, not even personal stuff, but honestly, uh, a lot of it is just used for m keeping factories running because to have an industrial economy, you have to have electricity produced on demand and a constant steady stream of it. And another one of the problems with wind and solar is that they're intermittent. You can't depend on them. So even in places where they've tried to have more wind and solar, they always end up making more either gas or coal plants as backup because you can't depend on them. And to have industrial equipment, it's incredibly fine-tuned. It can't take a lot of divergence. You have to have that steady, reliable stream of electricity. And the only way to produce that is through oil and gas and coal. So that's where most of the energy goes. Um, and about this is pretty much true around the world and in most countries. The amount of electricity that the countries use is between 20 and 25 percent is actually just electricity. And the other 75 to 80 percent is always just burning fossil fuel, fossil fuel directly um, for oil and gas. So even if you want to try to replace some of that electricity, it's still never going to be that 75 to 80 percent. You can't replace that with just electricity because that energy comes from oil and gas. Um, it's not electric. And a lot of times they'll make this, you know, sort of confusion and you'll see these headlines about, oh, they used 25% came from blood. It's, no, it didn't actually. What you're talking about is a percentage of the electricity. You're not talking about a percentage of the entire power used by the country because it's only a quarter yeah. of the energy is from electricity and people get very confused about that and so these headlines come across all the time and it's just really frustrating i i get that a lot of reporters maybe don't have a science background but i do get mad at the you know the people who are pushing solar and wind because they're supposed to know the difference between electricity and energy they're supposed to know that really the electricity is only 25 percent of the, the overall energy that a country uses and they seem to want to conflate these things all the time and I don't know whether they're pulling a fast one on themselves or whether it's just, you know, a parlor trick for the rest of us. But it's a lie, you know, and it's not a hard lie to discover. So Germany right now is really it's only about 3.3 percent of the energy comes from solar and wind. And they're not going to do any better than that. So people just need to face facts like you just can't generate that much using even if we were going to do it. You, you just can't generate that much. And the other problem with all of this, of course, is that. When you add more energy to industrial society, it never once has displaced a previous form of energy. All they do is add more to it. It's not like you could add 3% wind and now there'll be 3% less oil and gas. That's never how it works. Yeah, right. Now you have overall more energy and people are going to consume it because that's what capitalism is and that's what industrialization is. It never drops it. And this is Jevons paradox, which I'm sure a lot of your listeners are well aware of this concept. Um, but it making it cheaper and more available only means that people will use it more. So putting more energy into the grid doesn't make people stop using coal and, and oil. It just means there's more energy available and it gets used right up.
Yeah, so the overarching thing, I mean, even if we went beyond uh, solar and, and wind and hydro, and we haven't even gotten into this term biofuels. Oh, God. But not, not, not even, well, we'll get to that in a minute, but let's, but, but even if we, we got these, this uh, some magic thorium or whatever crap they're coming up with these techno utopians that truly gave us a what they call free energy. I love that 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 oxymoron. There's no such thing as free of it, but you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. All it does is the overarching. Even if we could come up and invent this thing, all it does is give us more energy. To, to ramp up destroying the planet. And, I know. and, and yeah. if anything, the, the, the worst thing we could do to this planet is come up with, quote, free energy. Do you agree with that? That, uh, that would yes. be, be horrible for the <laughs> this planet. This is the exact problem. This was the whole reason that the environmental movement became a movement. was We were turning the everything you know all the creatures all the places were just being essentially vacuumed up and turned into dead commodities and then turned into either private or collective wealth i don't actually care at that point that's not the issue and we were supposed to be the people who said we don't want our forests and our grasslands and our wetlands and our wolves and our bison turned into <laughs> like dead things to buy and sell. We wanted them to stay alive because this was our planet. And it's just beyond me. Why are we continuing to fuel the destruction of the only planet we have? And that's all this is, is just trying to find another way to keep doing that. But if you point this out to people, as, as you know, as well as me, and probably better because you've been down this rabbit hole a lot longer than I have, you're just labeled, you know, you are a dangerous eco-terrorist radical for, for daring to suggest that free energy uh, for, for the planet is, is a bad thing, uh, that, that you're going to be branded as, as you, you, you know, uh, I mean, what, what do you do about that? <laughs> Well, the FBI has been to my house twice. Um, yes, we are branded terrorists, and I don't really get it because it just seems like common sense to me. And I don't really know what people think we're going to do in 10 years, 20 years, 50 years when all the species are gone and all the phytoplankton are dead and there are no trees left and we've got no oxygen. And that's the end game here. We've all read the Lorax, right? Like, didn't that have an effect on anybody but me? I don't, I don't know. I, it seems so bizarre to me that we're all just willing to stand here and just let it all happen. So, so why, why are so many people who call themselves, and I'm talking about a lot of my personal friends who would sit there and look at me with a straight face and, and call themselves environmentalists? Uh, why are they buying into this? Is it, is it because Bill McKibben looks like their grandpa or what? I mean, what, what is it? Why are so many people getting led down the, the, uh, the bright green path? And to otherwise seemingly intelligent people. What's going on with them? Why, why is this happening? Well, a long time ago, in the 60s, there's philosopher Lewis Mumford who talked about the magnificent bribe. And he was well onto the problems with technological society. You know, he was one of the original critiques of it came from him. And that was the that was the phrase he used, that, that there was this magnificent bribe, that in, in we were trading in probably our future as a species and certainly our individual humanity um, in exchange for some technological goodies that made our lives temporarily better. And I think he was probably right that we are now, I mean, we're addicted, but we're also dependent. Like most people don't have anything to do with raising their own food. They don't know what a healthy river is. They have no idea why they would be dependent on one. Um, more people live in cities now than don't live in cities on, on a global scale. And they really have no idea where things like water and food and oxygen come from. To them, it all comes from the store, and you can only get to the store if you have your car or a bus. 
and the food only gets there through you know some kind of large truck that brings it in on a highway so that's what's necessary is that kind of infrastructure so they're dependent on the infrastructure and when you feel dependent on it you will of course defend it probably with your life whereas if they were directly dependent on the river and the fish in the river and the deer in the forest and the wood in the forest they would hopefully protect the river and the forest and the deer and the fish um and, and maybe it's just that you know we are not as smart as we think we are because it seems obvious that of course food comes from somewhere and ultimately it doesn't come from cement in the city it came from the countryside somewhere and you still need to protect the river and the forest if you're going to have food but I don't think people they just aren't thinking that final step of where did this actually come from they just know they're dependent on this huge system and so they feel loyal loyalty to that system yeah as uh we have wars going back at, well hell we, it, it certainly in this country back to the revolutionary war we can start with that one in our, in our own country to defend every to support what you just Said, let me ask you, uh, good Lord, how can we be 51 minutes into this? I feel like I just said, <laughs> uh, uh, who is your, your audience that you're looking for here? Now, I hear uh, as we can't escape, especially on a channel like Collapse Chronicles, you know, I don't, I, I don't uh, dream that people are, are watching my channel who disagree with me and anything that I'm going to say are, are, are going to change anything. So who are you, who is the audience for your book that's not just going to be totally preaching to the choir? Do you Are you aiming to change some minds? Yes, I am. My audience is especially young people, but really anybody who does feel that there's something terribly gone wrong on this planet. And I think especially for you know, the teenagers and people in their 20s, they're going to feel this emergency in a much bigger way. I mean, I feel it desperately. I always have my whole life. It's been one of the things that's motivated me since probably I was four years old. But I'm also 55, and I think I'm going to get out of here before the worst of this really hits, just because I'm older. Yeah. But if I was 20, I would be in a state of utter, complete panic right now. It wouldn't just be, you know, anger and grief and rage. It would be panic because it's they're, they're going to see this, you know, in a way that I'm probably not. I mean, it may hit in 10 years. I don't make predictions in terms of time because I, none of us really know. These biological communities are so complex. Like, who knows how long the plankton are going to hold out. But I'm assuming that the worst of this comes when I'm actually dead. Uh, but I would, I would feel that panic if I was younger, for I, sure. I so having said that, I you. think a lot of kids are very motivated. Um, they see how bad it is, and they certainly are concerned about global warming, and they should be because it's awful. Um, and, you know, they jump in feet first, and they don't have any background knowledge about it. They just know that, that they're feeling how bad it is, and they're scared, and they're angry, and they should be. And I totally support them in that. I, I'm glad they're alive to this. To, this, to what's going on, but what they find is these mainstream stream groups that are saying, solar and wind, we can do it. We just need more subsidies for solar and wind. We need the government to get behind solar and wind. We need our state governments to do it. We need our local governments to do it. Everybody needs to do solar and wind and hydro and biomass, and that will save the day. And they take it up with you know, all their passion, which, of course, is the gift of youth. And I'm glad that they have that passion. That's not the problem. The problem is they have not been given full information and nobody's telling them the truth. You have to dig deeper to, to really get this analysis. And, you know, they're young, so they haven't had time to find it yet. That's really my audience, is people who do care, who really feel the desperation of our situation, who do love the natural world, even if they don't have a lot of exposure to it. They get that we need it and that we're a part of it. And the things that are happening right now to all these endangered species that are being just, you know, just 200 species a day. Like, they feel that and they know that it's terrible. They want to do something about it. You know, they have a warrior spirit. They have a nurturing spirit. They they want to save the world. Like, that's the right impulse. But they don't have the correct information. I and have so I'm to trying have, to correct uh, the deficit. I'm trying to fill in the gaps here. That solar and wind and biomass are just as bad as fossil fuel. 
it's not a way forward, that you need a deeper analysis and a deeper critique of what has gone wrong. Are you sending the manuscript to Greta for her uh, to write a blurb? It, 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 Obviously, if she would uh, recommend reading this book, are you going to try to get a, a manuscript in the hands of Greta before it, it hits the... Uh, I did first? not think to try to get a blurb from her, but now that you've said it, I'm going to try. Why oh, not? Definitely. Oh, definitely. Oh, yeah. It would be, it would be really fun. <laughs> I would actually love to sit down with her for half an hour and just talk to her. Because I, you know, I know she's a very contentious figure. I think she's wonderful. I think anyone who's young and engaged and, you know, is willing to have a public profile in this day of social media where no matter what you say, it's going to be wrong. I mean, she takes so much crap from everybody. And I think she really means it. I feel her passion. I think she's amazing. I think all of those young people are. And I would love to just talk to her for half an hour because she's not stupid. She's clearly super smart. And she just hasn't run into the right information yet. And I think that she... I mean, I don't know. I don't know her, but I think that we could have a really great conversation. And I think that some of this, I think she would tweak to. I think her little gears would start turning and she, she'd want to know more. You know, even if I only had 30 minutes with her, she would do more research. I want to. She, she would, she'd come around to this. She, I don't think, I don't think she's far away from it. Okay. I want you to record that conversation and, okay. send, and send me <laughs> that. The 30 minute layer, uh, Keith, uh, Telling uh, Greta Thunberg how the world works. That would be the greatest 30 minutes in uh, collapsed chronicle history. Anyway, Lear Keith, I cannot believe it. Global industrial civilization is getting ready to collapse in three minutes here. So real quickly, if you're familiar with my uh, podcast, you know how I wrap up everyone. If you were not talking to Sam Mitchell at Collapse Chronicles for an hour, but you actually have the mainstream media with a microphone in your face saying, Lear Keith, give us your 60-second message soundbite to uh, the world in uh, March of 2020. <laughs> what would that 60 second sound like to wrap up this conversation? Industrial civilization is not functionally sustainable. We only have one planet, and this is our last chance to save it. All right, you did that in about 12 <laughs> seconds. And, uh, you, you must, have, you must, have, been, you must have been prepared. But, so I was not, we, in fact, prepared, but that is it right uh, there. Yeah, that's, that's what it boils down to. So condensation we, of everything right there. When do we expect to see the book? It'll be out probably January next year. It is at the publishers right now. They are, we're doing our final you know, kind of edits and whatnot with it. We're getting blurbs right now. It's very exciting. It took us a long time to find a publisher. It was pretty heartbreaking, but we found somebody really wonderful, and he's very brave, and we're going to get the book that? out. So, it's the publisher is Monkfish, and the uh, editor, the main editor's name is the guy who owns it is Paul Cullen, and he's an absolutely marvelous human being. So everybody, go look at Monkfish and buy a book and help him. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Well, I wish we didn't have to wait till January, but when it comes out, we will have this conversation again. But guys, we have got to we have got to wrap this up. And so uh, again, if you enjoyed what Lear Keith had to tell you about bright green lights, please spend a few seconds to thumb up this video. If you did not enjoy what Lear had to tell you. Spend a few seconds to thumb it down. And while you're over here, uh, please do subscribe to Collapse Chronicles for a lot more interviews where this one came from. And Lear Keith, we really appreciate you taking an hour out of your busy schedule to share some thoughts with us. And most importantly, keep up the good fight. You too. And I just want to thank you for your work because it's so important to be getting all of these kinds of thoughts and ideas and just information out to whoever will listen. There you go. Well, guys, well, stick around there for a minute after I wrap okay. this up. I have got to say thanks for listening. Bye, guys. <laughs>